this is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. What is a Christian spouse's only consolation for their non-believing spouse? Godly grief. What would comfort a Christian parent who has constantly been on their knees praying for their wayward child? Godly grief. What's probably the only comfort that a Christian friend could have for their backslidden or non-believing friend? Godly grief. And what was the only comfort for a weary church planner who for his struggling church plant has been on the brink of death on more than one occasion? Godly grief. See, the Apostle Paul, he was that weary church planter and the church in Corinth was that struggling church plant. Here are a few of the issues that the church in Corinth struggled with that we know of. Dividing over which preacher was better, incest, believers suing other believers, marriage and divorce, offering food to idols, worship snobbery, and the truth about the resurrection. See, of course, these issues caused Paul a great deal of spiritual discomfort, but these issues were not the main problem. The main problem is that the Corinthians were not displaying repentance. See, for Paul, the lack of Corinthian repentance was the most discomforting thing of all. So Paul does what most upset lay members do when something that they've seen has rubbed them the wrong way. He writes an email to the Corinthians. Well, it wasn't exactly an email. It was more like an e-scroll. It's a provocative letter of sorts, rebuking the Corinthians for their lack of repentance. After all, if you're not repenting, then that puts your faith into question. And if your faith is in question, then so is your status as a born-again Christian. And if you're not a born-again Christian, then you're dead in your trespasses and sins, and you might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But but back to Paul's letter. See, some theologians believe that the the letter that's referenced in verse 8 referred to the first Corinthians that we have in our Bibles. 
Others believe that the letter refer to some sort of correspondence in between first and second Corinthians. For our purposes today, that is of no concern to us. <laughs> what we are concerned with today is the spiritual impact that the letter had on the Corinthians. And what was that spiritual impact? Godly grief. My main three points today from today's text are the godly grief that grows, the growth from godly grief, and the glue of godly grief. And I chose all G's just to confuse you because I love you so much. That's why I did it. So look with me in verse 10 and let's explore the grief, the godly grief that grows. In verse 10, Paul provided his Corinthian readers and us with a clear contrast between godly grief and worldly grief. Some translations use the word sorrow rather than grief, but either way, it's a sad state of affairs. <laughs> there I go again with my sorry attempt at humor. <laughs> Is it too late to apologize? See, Paul clearly stated that godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Here, the focus is on the only two types of grief, one produced by God, the other produced by the world. Worldly grief is natural. It originates in our DNA, and it comes from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and it's contaminated with sin. The very fact that the worldly grief that oozes out of our pores is tainted with sin gives way to Isaiah's declaration that our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to God's righteousness in Christ, which is clean, pure, and from above. See, the residue of our sin is all over our good works like the syrup on my son's hands after he eats a plate of waffles. I have no idea how it happens. He gets the waffles, he stacks them on his plate, and he's just pouring the syrup all over it. He's got a fork in his hand, but somehow after he's done eating, there's syrup all over the place. There's syrup on the walls, on the table, then it gets on my wife's clothes, and then she gets mad because she has to change. But that's how our sin is on everything that we touch. Worldly grief is the grief that kills. And worldly grief kills because it deceptively produces a false assurance of acceptance with God. Now, God's grief is supernatural, and it comes from God, and it's worked into us, and then it flows out of us by God's Holy Spirit. The grief, according to God, produces an irrevocable repentance that leads to an irrevocable salvation. This here is an eternal security verse. In salvation, God has no takebacks. If Christ purchased you, then all sales are final. That's it. Christian, if you are repenting, then you have been restored to the fullness of life. If you are repenting, then you have been washed. Your sins have been forgiven and placed in the sea of forgetfulness, which is as far as the east is from the west. God's grief is the grief that grows. But what exactly does God's grief grow? Repentance. To repent is simply for one to change their mind. Repentance is that conscious change in the life of the sinner by which they turn away from their sin and they turn to God. Repentance is also the Siamese twin of faith. By faith, I simply mean belief in God's word. Repentance and faith together. 
It's God's word that informs our consciences of sin. And we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, believingly respond by turning away from that sin. Repentance and faith are proof of your conversion. Your conversion is proof of your regeneration. Have you been born again? Do you have a new outlook towards God? Do you hate the hold that your sin has on you? That's all regeneration means, to be born again. Well, if so, then when your sin is brought before your face, you must turn away from it and turn to God. If you are not turning away from your sin, then don't expect to have any comfort in this life. Expect chaos, just like the Corinthian chaos that Paul endured that spurred him to send this stinging letter to the Corinthians. Well, what made the Corinthians turn away from their sin? Godly grief. And what did this godly grief grow in these Corinthians? It grew a sense of urgency, a carefulness, a diligence in addressing the pink elephant in the room, a compunction which drove them to get off their rear and handle the problem of the rampant sin, not only in their hearts, but in their church. Look at it in verse 11. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. See, for the Christian, that godly grief, that good grief, it's the driving force that we need that kickstarts repentance into action. And Paul noted six indicators of how this good grief spurred these Corinthians on into repentance. Let's take a look at them. First was their eagerness to clear themselves. See, only God in his word gives us the knowledge of sin. You can't find it anywhere else. The Corinthians, by faith, showed that they believed God's report by their eagerness to get right with God, to clear their names of the sin that they had committed against God and each other. Do you have that eagerness? Secondly, was the Corinthians' righteous indignation, that constant irritating annoyance that escalated into anger from the sin in which they lived. That's the, that's the I hate my sin mentality, that temple table tossing kind of indignation. Do you have that kind of indignation? Thirdly was the fear. The Corinthians' reverential horror of the awfulness of God's wrath and grace that translated into honor in their worship to God and their dealings with one another. Do you have fear? Fourthly was the longing. The Corinthians' strong and deep desire to be in fellowship with God and his covenant people the right way in grace and in truth without sacrificing one or the other. Do you have that longing? Fifthly was the zeal. The Corinthians' passions were informed by God's word and then rightly channeled towards godly living and acts of service. Paul in Romans testified that his brothers, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, they had a zeal for God, but it was not according to God's knowledge. They did not have the necessary faith in Christ and his provision for us. And without that kind of faith, it is impossible to please God. Pre-godly grief, the Corinthians were not pleasing God. They were grieving God. Sixthly was the punishment. See, the Corinthian elders, they reopened their ecclesiastical courts and they reinstituted church discipline. 
I imagine that they withheld the Lord's Supper from unrepentant church men. And if absolutely necessary, they excommunicated the unruly and disobedient members from their church. By the way, did you know that the main goal of church discipline was restoration? It's to to restore the wayward brother or sister back into proper fellowship with God and each other. See, church discipline assumes that we are sinners and it anticipates that we will fall into grievous sins. And as a result, your elders have to visibly show how your sin has separated you from God by either withholding the Lord's Supper or through excommunication. Your elders may withhold the Lord's Supper because it is Christ's spiritual meal and it's meant to revitalize the weary Christian in their making war on their three enemies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. If you're not making war with these three enemies, then you are merely eating and drinking damnation upon yourself. And that's why each believer is called to first examine themselves and then eat and drink. According to the Presbyterian Book of Church order, excommunication is to occur only on account of gross crimes, kind of like the incest that we saw in 1 Corinthians, or heresy, and when the offender has shown a stubborn and willful disobedience to the elder's authority. I've had to do this, and it is one of the most painful things ever, because you show someone their sin according to what scripture says, and they just have a desire. They, they know it's right, but they say to themselves, I'm going to keep doing it. It is the most disheartening, discomforting thing ever. But when the church refuses to do church discipline, then the world will look at the church and they'll only see mirrors. See, the Corinthians in their self-initiated punishment, they proved, get this, get this, they proved that they were Christians. They actually started acting like Christians again. See it at the end of verse 11? At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Side note, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would you be innocent or guilty? Well, prior to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, they would be innocent of being Christians. But after Paul's letter to the Christian, they would be guilty of being Christians because of their repentance. Now, we saw how godly grief grew repentance, and we saw the growth from that repentance. Now, let's look at the unifying result of godly grief, the glue of godly grief. You see, unity in Christ is the goal of the Christian life. Unity is the glue of godly grief. Jesus, in his John 17 high priestly prayer, he prayed to God the Father, and he said, The glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Unity was Christ's goal. Unity was Paul's goal. But sin has no desire for unity. Sin desires separation. Sin is separation. See, the Corinthian sin is what separated them from Paul and all those whom Paul set up as elders in the Corinthian church. Sin is the reason why most elders don't want to do church discipline, just as sin is the same reason why most people don't want to undergo church discipline. So, as verse 12 tells us, Paul penned a letter not purely for the sake of the offender or for the one who was offended, 
But in order that the Corinthians earnestness for Paul and his elders might be revealed to the Corinthians in the sight of God. You see, Paul, he had a symbiotic relationship with all the churches that he set up, not just the Corinthians, but to the church in Corinth, Paul wrote. And, and put and put instead of Corinth, put first church in there to the church of first church. Paul wrote. You are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. To the church in Rome, Paul wrote, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Do you see the give and take relationship dynamic that Paul had with the church? You see it? See, the very fuel which powered Paul and his elders while they experienced affliction after affliction was the church's livelihood and through its members spiritual maturity. Somewhere down the line, the Corinthians lost sight of this symbiotic relationship and they became selfish. See, that's sin's modus operandi, selfishness. Paul's letter, in the sight of God, was the sorely needed cold bucket of water over the head of these Corinthians in order to remind them of their need, not just for Paul and his elders, but for the ultimate unity of the church. You'd be surprised of the impact that your spiritual suffering has on your elders, how your elders take your problems home with them, how they internalize your struggles, how and 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 they bring them before the throne of grace in prayer. Elders, if you don't care about the needs of your people, then this is your cold bucket of ice water over your head. See, we must seek the ultimate unity of the church through the peace and purity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, how does that come about? with good old-fashioned godly grief. Well, from where does this godly grief come? You guys ask such intelligent questions. It comes from the spirit of Jesus, which is the spirit of God. And this is important. Jesus' perfect life, his atoning death, and his resurrection is what unleashed his spirit to permanently indwell the lives of his covenant people. It is by the new birth that we are earnest to show forth our conversion from darkness to life by faith and repentance. Remember the Siamese twins? And in seeking to prove our salvation and maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, believer, you are possessed by God's spirit to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now my... uh. In my, in my Dr. Phil voice, hey, Christian, how's that working for you? Well, I'll tell you how. Terribly. But I keep on repenting. I keep on turning from my sin and turning to Christ. But I feel like I'm stuck in a rut. I've been struggling with the same sin for years. But I keep on repenting. I keep on turning from my sin and I keep on turning to Christ. But my anger and my lust and my disbelief and fear, they keep getting the best of me. But I keep on repenting. I keep on turning from my sin and turning to Christ. You noticing a pattern here? If only my spouse or fellow church members knew what I struggle with, they probably wouldn't talk to me anymore. 
But I keep on repenting. I keep on turning from my sin, turning to Christ. My wife and I, we keep arguing over the same things. Well, my wife needs to keep on repenting, turning from her sins and turning to Christ. My children are stubborn and disobedient. (laughs) I wonder where they get that from. (laughs) My children need to keep on repenting, turning from their sins and turning to Christ. As I say that, I see all the married men put their arms around their wives and come closer. We know it's us. We know it's us. I stopped attending church. And I know I should go back, but I can't because of the corruption in the church. So in the meantime, I'll comment on how the church should be doing things from afar, but I won't actually get back in the church and practice what I preach. My brother and my sister, repent from this hypocrisy. Turn from your sin and turn to Christ. Why well, don't too much enjoy the worship music? But I keep on repenting. I keep on turning from my sin and turning to Christ. Did you know that all these things and more go on in the life and mind of the believer? You mean to tell me Christ died for you people? Yeah, he did. Thank you, Howie. He did. If you are repenting. If the people that I described earlier are actually making war with their three enemies of the world, the flesh and the devil, then that's somebody that I would urge to sit down at the table with me to nourish their spirit with Christ's body and blood. I wouldn't think about I wouldn't think twice about the need to excommunicate somebody in this category. And this goes for everybody, homosexual, heterosexual, no matter what color, age, or background. In fact, one commentator tells us that repentance has three elements to it. Three elements. There is an intellectual element, there's an emotional element, and a volitional element. Three elements to it. The intellectual element, now stay close with me here. I'm going to wax a little theological, but you guys can handle it because you're first church. So the intellectual element is simply the knowledge of sin as revealed in God's word, or in our case, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the one that we saw in verses 8 and 12. Simply the knowledge of sin as revealed in God's word. That's all the intellectual element is. The emotional element is the godly grief that we've been talking about accompanied by those six indicators in verse 11. Remember the fear, the longing, the uh, indignation. Those, that's, that's part of the emotional element. The last one is the volitional element. That's the actively seeking pardon and cleansing. It is to prove yourself innocent in the matter, as we saw in verse 12. Repentance requires all three of these elements. But we don't always have all three of these elements. If you have the intellectual element, that's the knowledge of sin, without the emotional and volitional elements, that's the godly grief and actually wanting to do something about it, then you merely have the fear of punishment without the hatred of sin and no real desire to change. How many people do you know like that? If you have the intellectual and emotional elements without the volitional element, that's actually wanting to do something to clear yourself, then you'll know about your sin because God's word tells you about it and you'll hate it because the godly grief has caused you to hate it. But you won't necessarily turn from it. If you have the emotional and volitional elements, that is, you've got the godly grief and you've got the desire to change, but you don't have the intellectual element, God's not informing you of the sin, 
then you have someone who is only interested in self-improvement. And see, this is the worldly grief that produces death. Unbeliever, this last description is you all day and twice today. Get it twice on Sunday? See, you rest on your laurels, on your record of deeds and self-improvement instead of on Christ's deeds. You pride yourself on your self-discipline. In fact, from an objective standpoint, you may be more disciplined than most Christians that you know. (sighs) Did you know that the hashtag Me Too, critical theory, critical race theories, and cancel culture are the world's way of exercising its version of church discipline? You see what they're doing to all these celebrities who don't fall in line with them and their agendas? You see, unbeliever, your self-discipline, along with the world's discipline, has you both headed for an eternity apart from God's goodness in Christ. That's what we call hell. And see, this is because your wrath that comes from breaking your commandments is not wrathful enough. Your grace that's supposed to cover a multitude of sins is at best too weak to transform an individual or at worst, it's non-existent. That's what we see in these movements. There is no grace. There's only punishment. And we know as Christians that it is God's grace that saved us and it is God's grace that transforms us. The world doesn't have that. A rich sinner, this is the world's discipline, a rich sinner who becomes a poor sinner is still what? A sinner nonetheless. A racist sinner who loses their public platform, Kanye West, is only a racist sinner without a public platform. That's it. That goes for anybody. A binary cisgender heterosexual sinner is not acceptable in God's eyes solely for their sexual orientation. A law granting or banning the activities of non-binary transgender homosexual sinners does not grant its lawmakers or adherents entry into the kingdom of God. But on Judgment Day, your disheveled, not having it all together Christian counterpart, they will be worshiping at Christ's feet for all of eternity because God imparted his godly grief in them and they were moved to repent of the evil of their righteousness. You see, Christian, we have to be moved to repent from the evil of our righteousness. Your knowledge of God and sin may not be word for word the same as God's, unbeliever, but it has the same damning and separating effect when others break your commandments. See, your zeal for your commandments, but not according to God's knowledge, makes your guilt on par with those who know of and directly break God's commandments. Unbeliever, you are not okay. Don't don't bury your internal pain under mounds and mounds of positivity. See, your positivity is like that thin layer on top of a scratch and sniff sticker that which only after a little scraping pressure, it reveals the true you. Broken and miserable. Repent and believe the gospel. And after you repent, keep on repenting. See, just like the Christian unbeliever, your repentance, not your perfection, is proof of your acceptance with God. Say that again. Your repentance and not your perfection is proof of your acceptance with God. 
And this is a welcome word to you, especially if you don't fit in with the customs and the traditions of this church. You don't have to look like this church. You need to look like Christ. You need to be repenting. And if you're repenting and you don't look like me, we have more in common than you think. See, my prayer to Christ is that he would supply us all, believer and unbeliever, with a healthy dose of godly grief so that we keep on growing and repenting while fellowshipping with each other for the glory of God. So come, join us recovering sinners in this imperfect God-created institution called the church, where we imperfectly navigate through this tough and nasty terrain called the Christian life with the joy of Christ as our final destination, powering us alone. Turn to Christ and live. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, which convicts us of the sin in our lives according to your word. May we ever be in your word so that we can be conformed into your image from one degree of glory to the next. May we be not only informed of what your words say, but may we be moved by your godly grief and pushed into action to turn away from the very sin that separates us from you and each other. May we not be cowards to confront the sin in our lives, and may we be brave and bold with the courage that we have that Christ, our mediator, is sitting in between us, interceding for us right now as we speak. May the love of God empower us, enable us and transform us to do the nasty work of repentance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.